Alderman James Stern, the co-founder of, of the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. His award-winning graphic novel, The Gollum's Mighty Sling, has been printed in half a dozen languages and was chosen as the best graphic novel of 2001 by Time Magazine. His more recent work includes the 2008 graphic novel Market Day and the forthcoming book Off Season. James is also the author of the Marvel Comics miniseries Woo! Fantastic Four Unstable Molecules which won an Eisner Award, heard for Best Limited Series, and the Adventures in Cartooning Series. And now, without further ado, James Durham. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Landmark, for having me, Eve, for arranging this, everybody for coming out on a dreary, what is this? Wednesday night? Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction as well. Good. All right. So I'm going to uh, start at the beginning here uh, with my love affair of cartooning. And it started uh, five or six years old, begging my mother in a drugstore to buy this faucet uh, paperback, which was a collection of peanuts. Just on a show of hands, I, you know, you never assume one generation knows the kind of touchstones to another. How many people have never heard of Peanuts? Raise your hand. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't see any hands. Was there one hand over there? All right. All right. So that's still, that's still. Um, the world of uh, Charles Schultz uh, really meant a lot to me. Uh, it was a world kind of steeped in loss, unrequited love and melancholy. And as a lonely uh, kid who always felt like an outsider, uh, I could really seriously relate to Peanuts. Around eight or nine years old, uh, I discovered superhero comics. That was like the first superhero comic I bought. You can see how well read it is. Uh, and at that point, I became super obsessed with comic. In fact, my childhood dream was to someday uh, uh, draw the, uh, write and draw the Fantastic Four one day. And as mentioned in those introduction, I actually got to do that uh, not, uh, later in my career, um, even though I started moving away from superhero comics. So, growing up, Peanuts, superheroes, that was what I thought comics were, comic strips uh, and superhero comics, right? We associate comics with certain styles, formats, genres. Um, and this is basically when, whenever I would, whenever I sit on an airplane still, and you're talking to the person next to you, and they say, "What do you do?" and you say, "I'm a cartoonist." They're like, "What character do you draw?" Like their only frame of reference is like you're either drawing Superman or Batman or somebody, or or yeah, you do a comic strip, or maybe Archie, which I was exposed to from my my older sister who had a stock of those, stack of those, and I read those too. And comics, you know, just the name of it implies humor, right? Uh, even though that's not necessarily. So what I'm trying, I think I'm going to ask everyone to do today is kind of like rethink what comics are in a way. And um, I remember coming across this strip uh, in the newspaper. You guys know, you know Family Circus? Uh, in most newspapers, in our local newspaper up, in, up, up north, now we're here at Valley News, um, and this is something very familiar, and you used to like cute little quips about family life. But uh, Family Circus, most widely syndicated single panic panel comic strip, appears in 1,500 newspapers still. I don't even know there are 1,500 newspapers. Maybe that's a Wikipedia a mistake. <laughs> uh, but it, it's clear in this strip that the comics is a misnomer, right? Like, so here's Grandma, her back to, you know, her back's to you, and she's turning around. In the window, it looks like the, the, the sundown. There's a bare tree, right? Uh, and it almost looks like there's like a noose, the, the hanging of that like uh, window shade, right? Uh, and she, her, her eyes look tired. She's weary. And what funny thing does grandma have to say, right? <laughs> Instead of time marching on the way it used to, 
now it seems to be running out. So um, yeah, that kind of isn't like funny, uh, yet it's poignant, right? Like it's it's hitting a different note, uh, and you know people who love peanuts kind of uh, understand that as well. It was around the late 1960s when a critical mass of uh, cartoonists and small press people challenged the status quo and started to really think about comics as an art form, as a medium for personal expression. They explored the formal qualities of the medium. Uh, and by that I mean, it's like, what does a word balloon do? And, and can, you know, panel borders and, and, and actually incorporating those formal properties within the narratives of the stories they were telling. Uh, in short, they were taking a lot of acid and it got trippy really fast. Um, they took on the establishment, these, uh, I always want to say establishment in quotes, but anyway. Uh, they took on the establishments, the patriarchy, the squares, uh, and their work had this like searing uh, intensity and urgency to it. Uh, and the comics uh, divided, um, delved into political, personal territory uh, that was shocking then, and in today's political environment, it's even more so. And in fact, I had to change what slides I even put on for this slide. I was like, oh, I can't show that stuff anymore. Uh, it's really, it's super offensive. And that was, and that was their point, I, I suppose. But that's, a, that's, a, that's another discussion. Uh, it inspired me when I was, uh, when I went off to college, uh, pre-internet, uh, discovering underground comics is what made me think I could have a career in cartooning. Because I, I couldn't draw superheroes like they were supposed to look. I wasn't going to do a comic strip. So to see this very raw, um, you know, almost like folk art some of it, I thought, oh, well, that I can do. And, and, I, and I feel an urgency to tell a story. Um, from this underground comics movement came the rise of the graphic novel. Art Spiegelman, who was part of that movement, the underground movement, uh, continued to explore the potential of comics. And in 1986, he published the first part of this groundbreaking memoir about his father's, uh, his father recounting his time in a, in a concentration camp during World War II in Auschwitz. Um, and it also um, told the story of Art's relationship to his father and how his father's experience shaped his relationship with him. Um, it's Maybe remains, it remains uh, the high, one of the high, you know, probably one of the greatest graphic novels ever created and has been incredibly influential in terms of showing what uh, the power and potential of the medium can do and that no subject matter, not even uh, the Holocaust, is off limits. Here's a few books. Uh, I could probably show 100, but Mouse had a tremendous impact on the medium. Uh, comics just aren't for kids. Uh, it's not just trashy literature, although I love trashy literature too. Uh, it's not aimed just at the lowest common denominator. Uh, but they could be insanely smart, literate, thoughtful, compelling, subtle. Uh, and the idea that comics isn't just a genre, like superheroes or, or funny animals, but it's a medium. You know, just like a, a writing could be, you know, you could write a cookbook, you could write a, a user manual, you could write poetry. Um, comics can <coughs> cover all of that as well. So I had this idea about 20 years ago uh, to start a school that believed comics is a medium, not just a genre, and it's a school where, where each student would you know, hopefully find their own unique voice and style. This was a preliminary drawing by a, a, a Canadian cartoonist named Seth. Uh, and uh, we took this drawing up to the state house to try to get some funding. Uh, and I still, I still smile when I see it. It was like the <laughs> idea, right? It was like the blueprint for the school almost started uh, in some ways with this drawing. And many of our students have gone on to do some wonderful work. Has anybody seen The End of the Effing World on Netflix? Show of hands. That started as a graphic novel uh, at the, in, in Vermont, right up the street by Chuck Forsman. If you haven't seen it on Netflix, it's a great, it's a really great series. Um, Spinning Tilly Walton is like a recent graduate. She just did this memoir about figure skating, her, her time in figure skating. House of Woman by Sophie Goldstein. 
Um, anyway, on and on. Uh, very proud of the, of the work uh, that they've done. So I've been sharing things like you know graphic novels and, and comic strips and, and, and all stuff that you could buy in a bookstore and you, you read and it's you know very much entertainment uh, or uh, something something that 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 you would um, yeah a commodity that you would purchase. But here's this this question that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Uh, and for those who have bad eyes, I'll just read it. Uh, what if comics aren't simply a quaint feature of geek culture. They're reading Action Dork, and I, I, I picture like a San Diego comic convention. This is a comic I did with a, a friend, uh, Merrick Bennett. Uh, but instead, uh, if comics were a way that the world processes information. Picture writing and visual literacy have once again become our primary modalities for shaping and sharing ideas and information. Uh, Scott McCloud, who's a cartoonist and uh, the author of Understanding Comics, among other texts, uh, he talks about cartooning is a form of amplification through simplification. And in the broadest sense, over the last 10 years, our culture has changed dramatically. I, I, I said during dinner I was going to talk about this stuff, and I'm, I'm no liar here. Uh, we're more wired now than ever, uh, and our primary modes of communication are pictorial, right? Uh, emojis, uh, we communicate on Snapchat, Tumblr, video, using pictures. The age of the typewriter is over, and when we make newsletters, <coughs> business proposals, public lectures, uh, class projects, or even corresponding with friends, we're not just using words anymore, we're using iPhones, tablets, computers, uh, and these, are, these aren't, these are these are image writers. Writing with pictures is embedding narrative into a visual architecture, and this is how we communicate in the digital age. And when we think about what literacy is going forward, uh, that definition, whatever it is, it has to include pictures. And in many ways, comics are like the ABCs of visual literacy. And by studying comics, I believe we can learn to use images to communicate with precision and nuance. All right. Uh, these are, these, this is a publisher called uh, Toon Books. Uh, it was founded by the art editor of The New Yorker, Francoise Moulet. Uh, and it is a publishing house dedicated to using comics to teach both traditional and visual literacy. And Francoise uh, says, uh, when it is done well, a cartoon can actually be not a reduction, but a summation and a distillation of complex ideas. And you know, like, when you all leave tonight and you think someone's, you know, you're talking to a, maybe a parent or somebody who didn't come, some poor soul who missed this amazing scintillating speech. They're gonna say, hey, what was that thing about, right? You're not gonna, re you're gonna remember like one thing I said, maybe two at the, at the most, right? Um, but perhaps if right now you were taking graphic notes and drawing little images as I talked and, and just captured a thing or, you know, three or four things, uh, you would you would might be uh, creating a summation and a distillation, and I think that might help um, some some memory retention, uh, some more takeaways, right? Um, graphic note taking is like kind of becoming a thing, so maybe I'll, I'll even talk about that a little bit later. Um, as a kid, uh, there was a few stories that sold comics, right? The, the, the drugstore where I got my my Schultz paperback. Uh, and, 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 and the, the pharmacy that had the spinner rack. Uh, but now I see comics everywhere. Everywhere I go, I see comics. Uh, they're being used by companies for training. This was, uh, so Ben and Jerry's published, uh, I think it was like six issues at least. Uh, one of my uh, graduates were doing these. Uh, and, and for their production line, uh, I learned so much about how to prevent putting craters in, you know, like a crater in, in your Ben and Jerry's when there's just like not enough ice cream, there's just a crater, or about um, allergens and how to prevent allergens uh, from, from, you know, if you're making a, something with peanuts, you don't want that to get into your vanilla. Uh, and, and the way they would train 
the production people is they would give them they would give them comics uh, drawn, drawn drawn by Brian Stone. <laughs> In the past few years, uh, we're seeing the rise of graphic journalism, and uh, I, I this is um, this is actually th this piece is by Sophie Yano, one of our uh, former students and faculty members, and um, Joe Sacco, who uh, is one of the great practitioners and, and maybe godfather of graphic journalism, um, and I, I think like. Graphic journalism really, really, it's always made sense to me when I when I think about journalists, photographers. Um, sometimes with a video camera, right? It, it's almost like a vacuum. The video camera goes into a situation, quickly sucks up images, and then you know spits it out. I I know there's more to do it than that, but when you think about the 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 hand is, is a really slow, methodical witness, uh, in the hand of an individual reporter immediately dispels uh, the misleading conceit of objectivity and connects the story to its audience uh, in, a, in a different way, in, in, in sometimes a more intimate way uh, than, than the majority of, 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 of journalism. Beyond uh, publishing, comics uh, is also a way to facilitate communication and deepen understanding. Um, that comic I mentioned with uh, Marek Bennett, the ones with the mice I was reading from earlier, uh, he's taught at CCS and he has led trips to Nicaragua. And he uses comics to teach literacy to families of coffee growers. Uh, and they in turn teach him and an American audience about how coffee gets from Nicaragua to New England. This is a cartoonist and educator, uh, teaches art in Massachusetts High School, uh, Cara Bean. She uses graphic note-taking when she is at a conference to help her retain the speaker's most salient points and share with colleagues, um, as I was talking about. Um, she, this is interesting, like she didn't eat, this was, this happened a few years back and she went to a conference and did her graphic notes and then just like, oh, I'll kind of post them. And then it was like shared like tens of thousands of times. Uh, and she just did it for her own, for her own memory. And, and she realized uh, she was onto something. And now uh, at the cartoon school, we teach graphic note taking and we're getting more requests for uh, organizations. Uh, actually tomorrow, I'm going up to the state house for the symposium on journalism uh, in, this, in this political age. And uh, I'm going up with a couple of graphic note takers, including this graphic note taker, who's also my daughter. Um, <laughs> so I had to throw that in as a proud parent. Um, but these pages are from uh, last, uh, this just this last summer, um, graphic medicine conference that the Cartoon School, uh, Center for Cartoon Studies hosted with the Geisel School of Medicine in Boston. Yes, graphic medicine. Uh, this is the place where healthcare and cartooning meet. What? It's true. It's a thing. We were like the 10th, 10th, uh, 10th annual conference. And uh, almost every other year it's held in Europe. So um, it's been at Johns Hopkins and, and in Seattle and, and um, England. So. Uh, this is the author and scholar Paul Gravitt says, something remarkable and game-changing is being sparked by the alliance between comics and medicine. It's becoming clear that these graphic narratives can deepen understanding not only of facts, but of feelings between patients, families, and professionals. One example of graphic medicine, uh, a few years ago, uh, Center for Cartoon Studies uh, worked with uh, DHMC, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical School. They, they have a, they had an maybe they still do have it Innovation and Design Center, uh, and they were trying to sell their vision and try uh, on, on what they need to do in the coming decades to deliver uh, healthcare. Trying to get ahead of the technology curve and remain solvent. So they were entering a, di a dialogue, and they were um, talking about how you know soon. We're going to be able to, oh, you need a hip surgery? Okay, you can just go on eBay or you can, you know, do a, a price line check or something. 
uh, and, and get the best deals. And, and when this becomes the reality, uh, you know, how, how it'd, be, it'd be better to be ahead of that curve uh, than, than behind it. Um, so we help them kind of frame some of that discussion uh, using visual narratives. Another example of the relationship between um, medicine and comics uh, was some work we did with the White River Junction VA. Uh, this was a, uh, you know, the, the, this is a mile up the street from CCS on this hill, gate, drove by it a thousand times. And I was like, what the heck goes on in there? And you hear stories about veterans and, and what's going on and this divide between the people who serve and people who don't. So I, I started volunteering and it's become this really interesting relationship. And one of the things that I, 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 as, I as I started educating myself and thinking to myself, okay, I'm a cartoonist and I have this toolbox, right? I understand comics. How can this toolbox be of any assistance to the people that are, that are at the VA. Uh, and we started exploring ways comics could be used in therapeutic capacity and uh, help those. Uh, in, this, in this exercise, we, we were actually, I was working with uh, people uh, suffering from PTSD. And, and before I went up there, you know, what do you do when you're trying to prepare for anything or something you don't know about? You kind of Google it, right? So it's like, I don't want to go in there and I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, okay. What do you what 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 do you you know what don't you say to vets? You type that into Google and you get all these articles about things you don't say to vets, uh, you know, to unintentionally um, um, kind of trigger or 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 upset them or or just be insensitive. Uh, and there was a list of things. And when I met with the vets, I said, you know, I, I went online and I, I saw this list, and they they're like, oh yeah, so many people say so many stupid things. And I said, okay, here are index cards, write them down. So they wrote them down, and then I took old New Yorker cartoons and took out the panels, and then we took their like punchlines uh, <laughs> with, you know. And, 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 and we had a lot of laughs, it was funny. Um, and we took something that was really toxic and triggering, and suddenly we, we kind of made light of it, right? So when somebody said something stupid, rather than getting angry, maybe they thought of like, oh, that, that'd be a funny comic. You know, so that was, no, I don't want to get a drink. Like, <laughs> where's it to go, right? So, so that, that, that was really interesting. Um, what I found as a comics educator when I want to use comics in a therapeutic setting, um, I know for adults, like when I work with young kids, like they just love to draw. They don't care. They pick up a pencil. They start drawing. Older people can cause anxiety. So if you're dealing with a group of people that are already feeling a lot of anxiety and you're asking them to draw, that's, that, that's not good all the time. So part of this exercise was no one has to draw, right? Like I'm already providing the drawings. So that was great. Um, one of the things that I thought about in terms of PTSD and cartooning, right? Like when you look at a comics page, right? There's, let's say six panels on a page or whatever it is. And each one of those panels is a discrete unit of time. And what you're doing on a comics page is you're arranging those units of time into a narrative so that past, present, and future all um, work together in a way to make some kind of coherent narrative. And from my understanding of PTSD, like a lot of times it's, it's you cannot do that, right? Like your past prevents you from seeing a future or your present is your past. Um, so one of the things I started doing is as I was sitting down with people, I would just take these little squares of paper and say, oh, what's going on? And somebody would be, oh, I can't talk to you. My mind's just racing or something. And I was like, okay. And I just would draw like racing thoughts. And I would just draw on a piece of paper. Just, you know, I don't know what it was it racing about. Oh, um, I didn't get this brown bag lunch or something. And slowly I would just kind of start creating this narrative with this person. And over eight panels, 12 panels, Oftentimes, you know, we could get to something that I don't know if we could have gotten to or I couldn't have gotten to any other way. Uh, and then sometimes these comics would become uh, little comics they could hang on the refrigerator to help with like self-care, things that they could uh, take back to them. So uh, um, um, take back to their apartments when they're out of therapy to remind them of, you know, check-in moments or ways to um, 
yeah, pra uh, pra pra uh, practice um, yeah, better, better health. Um, so myself and a lot of my, my students, we were kind of visiting the VA, working with their, um, their therapists, uh, and we decided to uh, do an, another project. And uh, this was a project that was partially funded by uh, the NEA, where uh, the CCS cartoonists worked with vets to help tell their story. I figured it'd be, I have students uh, who are just like, I mean, I'm, I was the same way. You just, all you care about is your own story, right? And like, you know, they'd be really bumming out because they couldn't figure out like act three of their space opera, uh, which is important. But suddenly like you talk to somebody who had their legs blown off and is in the residential recovery unit and has this other story and it just helps put things into perspective. Uh, and then for the people that are in the residential recovery unit, they have an opportunity kind of to be heard um, and be able to try to have someone help shape that narrative. And it was this kind of, I don't know, this relationship that seemed everybody was getting something out of it. So we brought cartoonists together, we brought um, 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 vets together, uh, and, uh, and it resulted in these two books. And they're free online, you can find them through our website. Uh, when I returned, uh, and then uh, a whole lifetime of firsts, with, which is, just came out. Um, and um, very, very uh, proud of this work and feeling, you know, sometimes when you're in the arts, you can just feel like totally marginalized. Uh, you're doing work because it feels like a calling and, and it's important to you and you're doing it for not for therapy, then at least therapeutic re there's, there's therapy, there's something therapeutic going on about it. Um, and you know, you, you go to signings and no one shows up. <laughs> uh, and probably the most gratifying book launch I've ever been to was when this first one came out and, and the vets were just so pleased to be taking part of it and, and the, the artists who worked on the stories who, um, yeah, didn't, didn't really have any audience, but that room, they could really understand how powerful their efforts could be, uh, you know, with people that, in their community that, you know, beforehand were, were probably invisible to them. So I, I kind of call this, 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 uh, this field of cartooning, um, you know, where, where you're not just calling for, you're not just cartooning because it's your, for, for your own personal expression, which I would never discount, but this is like how do you apply how do you apply the skills of a cartoonist out into the world? How do you use your cartooning um, you know to connect with with the world around you I mentioned uh, comics and education, graphic medicine, you know, doing business projects and communities. Uh, the same daughter that I just mentioned, she went uh, to college, this freshman in college this year, and she, you know, she does graphic note taking. And during orientation, we, we drove her out to college, and she went to the you know the majors fair or whatever they call it. And there was uh, the anthropology department, and she was talking to a, one of the professors. And she you know at, that later that day when I saw her, she's like, guess what? There's something called graphic anthropology. What? Uh, <laughs> So now she's you know, really looking forward to this graphic anthropology class in the spring. So, so this, this new world of, of, of communicating with pictures uh, where, where everyone, if you can manipulate an image to tell a story, if you can embed narrative into a visual architecture, you know, this is what, this is, if you do that, you're, you are a cartoonist. And I feel like everybody's doing that to a certain extent. Um, so now how do we kind of start Kind of helping people do that with with more subtlety, more nuance to help them connect, tell them, help people, help them tell stories that might not be told. Uh, to use that as a way to to um, kind of cut through all the noise, to distill things without simplifying them. And I think this is something that uh, cartooning is really, really, really good at. Um, Wow, I am looking at the clock right now, and it's like, oh, almost 40 minutes in, right? 
is this, is, this, is this the question time where it's like, whoa, all these things that I've been talking about. What? Uh, should we do some questions? And uh, I'd be happy to talk about anything. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of you want to watch the World Series tonight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 before I forget, too, before I forget, um, there are these, like, uh, so Michelle Ali is the president of the cartoon school who I work with. And she, uh, she did this book from the desk of the president, and it's about her using comics to overcome her dyslexia. And, and up by the camera, there's, there's one for everybody in the room. Actually, there's probably two for everybody in the room. <laughs> so you can take one for a friend, uh, and they're free, and it's like a party favor if you so care to, to grab one. How long have I been being a cartoonist? Yes. I started cartooning uh, by copying you know, comic books and, and when I was a kid. So learned by copying and, and then just kept going. Yeah, so it, it was definitely something I wanted to do really early on. Yeah. What do you think of web comics like uh, Penny Arcade or Hark of Vagrant? Well, Hark of Vagrant is amazing. It, it's dead, you know. I mean. Yeah, she just yeah. hung up the, yeah, hung up the vagrant or whatever, <laughs> walked away. Hopefully, she'll come back to that because that was amazing. Yeah. I, I love the history jokes. So, so uh, if if you haven't read Kate Beaton's um, *Hark a Vagrant*, uh, it's still online and it's really, it's a spe really special comic. She'll take old uh, Nancy Drew comics and kind of retell those stories, and she uses classic literature and history. Uh, and she goes back to it with this like knowing wit. Um, Penny Arcade is that a strip or is that like a collection of strips? Um, it, it's, it's like a publishing. They, they, they distribute. It's like a it's site on, that has. It's another web comic. Um, I'm, I'm not sure when they moved to the site, but they've been around since I think the late '90s. Yeah. Well, doing I'm, mostly stuff about like video games, but they've moved on to who talk about their families a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think comics can be on a printed page on the web. It's great. Um, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, how about that hand and then up there and then and then you. And then we'll do another three if there are some people. So my question is, dear cartoonist, what do you think of anime and manga? What do I think of it? Uh, I think it's great. Like I said, like I think of comics like those are all, it's all comics to me. So those are, you know, certain types of styles and drawings. You know, I, I once did a New Yorker cover. And that was like my, you know, that's like a big time illustration gig in the, in the, in the world of illustration. And my, my, my New Yorker cover, the Yankees had just signed Hideki Matsui, who was you know, the first Japanese everyday player in the major leagues. So I drew him in a manga style, and then I drew like the dugout behind them in this kind of like old school, like sepia tone baseball. <laughs> and I had to um, study manga very carefully to draw that just right. Um, and my other really deep appreciation, the reason I even did a baseball manga is I did a, a book called Gold's Mighty Swing. It was at this baseball team. And a friend of mine mailed me all these Japanese uh, baseball manga. And they were just amazing in terms of the choreography and how I couldn't read Japanese, but I could read like hundreds of pages of manga. And just through um, the visual storytelling, be able to get a sense of all the characters, their personalities, I, I, I got like really gripped by the narrative, you know, the, the travels of this team, the wins, the losses. Uh, and in comics, like you're in you know, the nar you're telling the story with pictures. Uh, so even if you can't read the words. And uh, so I'm, you know, I mean like anything, like manga, if it's done well, it's breathtaking and absorbing and wonderful. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of crappy manga there too, right? Like everything. So um, yeah. Um, there was a hand up. Oh, yes. Um, in your opinion, what was the first ever comic? A cave drawing? Yeah, maybe some cave drawings. How's that sound? I mean, it's pictorial, like, it's picture writing. You know, I, I showed that family circus strip the other day. I've been thinking a lot about this. I was. Um, lately, because uh, the Hood, the Dartmouth Art Museum, 
they have like this amazing collection of Indian ledger drawings. And they had an exhibition. And for those who don't know, um, you know, ledger, ledger books are like, you know, like they're accounting books. They're just like, you know, you buy them and then you put what you sold and put numbers in. But like um, when, when, when in the 1860s, as the Indians were kind of being rounded up and putting on reservations, and they were in, interned, is that right? Word? Uh, yeah, internment camps. Uh, they would, the, the, the tribes would, would start, people, members of the tribe would, would record the history and the battles of their people in these Indian ledger draw books, uh, in, in these ledger books. And these comics look so much like Family Circus. I mean, 100 years before Family Circus, right? It was like, here's the person, you know, like in Family Circus, you can see like the little kid, and he went around the neighborhood, and there's dot, dot, dots, and see where he went. There it is, like the person sneaking into a teepee, and how many people he killed, and their battles. And they were just, I mean, to my mind, like, they, they were comics. And, and what happened was when, when the, they, they started to become collector's items and people would rip the pages out of the ledger books, so some of the narrative um, parts of it were lost. They would only be like single images. But these were graphic novels. Like in 1860, before, you know, Will Eisner, before you name it. So, um, you know, that's, those are comics as well. So I, 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 think of, I, I think of comics as just picture writing. That's, that, that's my... My, defi my definition. Um, there was one person here that had their hand up, but no. You, you had your hand up. Yes. Okay. Um, how do you develop a career as a cartoonist? Right. <coughs> how do you develop a career as a cartoonist? Well, here's the thing, right? Like, I knew comics early on was like my thing. And I was gonna do my thing no matter what. And then you become really stubborn <laughs> and dogged. And eventually you get some, you, you learn a thing just by doing it, even if you don't think you're the most talented or this or that. You just you pick up tricks along the way out of necessity. Um, and in the arts, in the arts, you're con like if you ha it's a war of attrition. Like if you hang out long enough in the arts, someone's gonna give you a job or a show or a book contract eventually, right? Like, yeah. But you, but the career, um, the career was just like taking. I guess I, I I moved around the country a lot to opportunities. I interned, like when I was, when I moved to New York, I interned uh, at Raw Magazine where Art Spiegelman and Francoise, who, who's the toon book person and New Yorker person, uh, had this magazine, Raw Magazine, and I learned a lot just from helping Art Spiegelman do uh, photo stats, like pr a production of his, of his book. Um, I just, I moved a lot. And, and, I, and I also knew that I was going to do comics no matter what. And I never, to be honest with you, I never thought of it as a career. You know, and I still, I mean, I still don't. Like every morning, like I get up and I work on some stuff, and I don't know, if I'm, I don't know what's going to happen to it, but it's just that's what I, what I do. And then, and I just built some skills along the way. I don't, that might not be a satisfying answer, but I don't know. Network? <laughs> uh, back there? Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, like, what kind of comics would you say were a big influence in how you went about making your own? That's a good question. Uh, so the comics that were big influences in how I make my own. Definitely the underground cartoonists, just because I felt like they were so raw and ratty and, and, and some of them just seemed poorly drawn, <laughs> but I, that it just gave me permission. Like, like, boy, if these people can publish and there's like this, they have some type of urgency that they'll put this down. So that was really um, amazing. I mentioned Art Spiegelman who did mouse. So, so before there was uh, scanners, if you wanted to prepare a piece of artwork for publication, you had to um, take a photo of it in, in this dark room with a photostat camera. And one of the things I did as an intern is I went, when he was serializing mouse, I had to go into this like kind of dark room and he had this uh, binder with plastic sleeves and there was the page of mouse. And I, I pulled out the page and took a picture of it. But underneath that page was an earlier draft. And underneath that page was the draft, an earlier draft. And each plastic sleeve had like, you know, six or seven deep of preliminary sketches. 
And with comics, like, people are like, I don't know how many times people have been like, I got a great idea for your next book, or do this comic. Because when you read a comic, it looks very effortless if you do it well, right? Like, like oh, quick little doodle. But, you know, sometimes it takes me a day to do that. You know, I have to draw that quick little doodle like 20 times or something. <laughs> um, so with art, I got to see his process and his thinking. And, 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 you know, it took him 13 years to do Mouse. And just the level of craftsmanship um, and thought that would go into every page uh, really um, was a game changer for me. You know, because like comics traditionally, like you did a daily strip every day. Great. Uh, if you were going to be a comic book artist, you draw 30 pages of the Spider-Man every month. So, you know, when you think about it in terms of a, a commercial industry, it's very kind of deadline driven and you have to be quick. And I am just not a quick, uh, I can't draw quickly. Um, so, you know, that's why I thought maybe I can't be a cartoonist because I can't keep up this pace. But when I started thinking like, as a writer, you know, because if, if a novelist comes out with a novel every five years or four years, it's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, that takes a while to write a novel. Um, so I very much, um, you know, doing that changed changed the way I think about uh, myself as a creator and not not worrying so much about about how quick I am, uh, but just really um, working, thinking about the process of, of making and getting really kind of um, trying to get as intimate with my own creative process. Here. Okay, so um, I think Rhiannon is going to be our last question, and then I'll turn off the lights. I want to thank everybody for coming. If you still have questions, just come on up. Uh, I was just going to ask, you said earlier, um, comics is not a medium, it's a genre. No, no opposite. It's, oh, sorry, opposite. Yeah, I, might have said the wrong, I might have said the wrong thing. No, it's okay, okay. you're probably right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that kind of led me to think, um, I was just wondering how you might describe the difference or similarities between illustration and art. Between the difference between illustration and art, or illustration and comics, or comics illustration and art. Illustration and art. That's interesting. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I could help you with that. There is actually a, a genre. It's more like sci-fi, fantasy. Those are genres. More like comic books, movies, video games. Those are mediums. I would say. This is true. But to, to actually explain it, that difference, now that really gets tricky and tough. Yeah, I mean, just the word illustration makes it sound like you're using your craft mm -hmm. in service of something else. Like you're illustrating something. Like here's a short story. Do a, you know, here's a novel. Illustrate the cover. Yeah. Here's an op-ed piece. Illustrate a, you know, illustrate something that goes with the article that will bring out an aspect of that article, um, you know, or, or, or to attract people to that article. Right. Whereas I feel like art... Um, it's not like it, it's not a um, like maybe illustration is the carriage and art is the horse. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, like I feel like art like like I once made the mistake of like selling a book on a on a pitch, mm -hmm. uh, and then when you sit down and do the book, it's like suddenly it's not a science fiction story. It's a memoir or something. Like think like as you follow a creative process. Things go left and right and sideways. Right. And if you're an artist, that's all you give a crap about. It's, right. like, it's like following that muse and going where the material leads you. As an illustrator, no. Nah. You don't have that luxury, right? You gotta, you're an illustrator and you were hired to do something. And you've got to, and, and I, I think of illustration more as like, um, crap, someone who's applying their craft to a problem. Where it, art is like you're trying to like um, I don't know delve into the mysteries of the universe and create like a, a, a new language from scratch sometimes I don't know um, it just seems like a much um, seems like a dicier and more dangerous proposition making making art than, than illustrating <laughs> I mean maybe no less anxiety producing if you have yeah. a lot of deadlines <laughs> but um, can I take one more question one, did you have a question oh I had a question. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So I teach drawing. Yes. Right. And I have a lot of students who come into my class, yeah. and they want to draw manga. Yeah. And they want to, I say, do a self-portrait, and they want to draw themselves as a manga person. Yeah. <laughs> I've often said, well, that's kind of cultural appropriation, a little bit in terms of the the medium, no genre, medium <laughs> of manga. How important do you think it is, James, in terms of artists or 
you know, future yeah. comic book artists or cartoonists to develop their own personal style and vocabulary and language. I just uh, think that happens anyway. I, I just feel like if, if, you, if you start committing yourself, I, your copied manga drawings will become your own manga drawings. I mean, like, we, we all have um, our own, you know, we're all working from somebody's manner drawings and styles, you know, whether it, it's, whether it's the canon or it seems, you know, uh, different. But I, I don't know. I kind of feel like I, 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 that's fine. Do your manga self-portraits, and when you do your 100th manga self-portrait, it'll become weirder and different and grow in a certain way. And I don't know, that question about a cultural appropriation, it's like, our whole culture is cult. I mean, American culture is cultural appropriation. <laughs> like, it's an exchange, and it's, it's um, I would never want to sh shut that down. I mean, manga, they appropriated Walt Disney, right? Like, like, like Tezuka, T Tezuka, uh, one of the great manga artists, like he was a Disney fiend, right? And then he created this whole language, and then they send it back to us, and we send it back to them. So it's a really cool thing that happens. I mean, I, obviously there are ways that we can, you know, we can be insensitive about that as well, and I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, but, you know, I, I remember, and, I, and then I'm going to stop. I said 7.49. Were you good? Okay. <laughs> but I, I remember when I used to teach foundation classes, I realize, like, art schools in general probably have it, I think they have it generally wrong, in my humble opinion. Every art school is wrong. I think they should just, like, like you're a freshman, go right to your major. Like, your first year, take your introduction to photography and cartooning and illustration, and, and, and just, like, that's what you want to do. And if, and if you, you're two, the freshmen say, okay, now we're going to learn design and drawing, they're going to be like, oh, okay, I just want to do my own thing. And if you just let them do that, they're going to hit a wall, and then they're going to say, oh, shit, like, well, why aren't I progressing? And it's like, hey, let's look at this photographer. Let's look at this designer. Let's talk about some fundamentals. And then they'll be really receptive to that. So I always feel like, oh, fundamental, like, like those foundational things should maybe be either woven through the other classes or, like, start that your sophomore year or junior year, and then they can bring their own major to that and see how it will improve their work, but all right, any other world problems we need to solve? Uh, thank you everybody uh, for coming. Thank you. That was a lot of fun.